Excellent. Good. Okay. Okay. So, um, the, the Darlington College uh, started with uh, Google some time ago, probably six, seven years ago now. We um, we yeah. were using another VLE at the time that wasn't work. really suitable for what we were using. So, us in computing, being rebels, we moved away from what we were told to use and started using Google Drive instead. And that meant creating a lot of personal Google accounts for students and staff, and then creating a lot of shares. So when uh, Google Classroom came around, we jumped straight onto that. So a little bit about Darlington College first, just in case you don't know who we are. We're up in the Northeast. We, uh, we service around about 200,000 people um, in North Yorkshire, County Durham. We deliver 1,600 plus learning aims to in excess of 13,000 full-time students and apprentices and higher education students. And in 2015, it wasn't one of our strong points. We were graded as in inadequate by Ofsted. But I'll come back to that later. So a bit about me. This is my 20th year in, in, uh, in teaching. Um, I'm actually an electrical engineer. And um, I've taught across five different colleges, all in the Northeast. But I've taught across five different colleges and I've picked up a lot of experience. But in all of that 20 years experience, I've always been involved in educational technology. And last year, I became a Google certified trainer and a Microsoft certified educator. And in January, I was invited to talk on the Google stage at BET. And I'm also one of the FE Twitterers to follow. Uh, the, I don't know if you have, uh, know of the periodic table of FE Twitterers. If you are on Twitter, then by all means, follow at Wayne G. Hall. And uh, I'll, I'll always follow back. So how do we get here? Well, in 2013, 14, as I mentioned, we were using SharePoint, which is very much a, um, a workflow management system used in large enterprises. It's not really suitable for education. So we moved to, as I mentioned, to move to Google Drive in 2014, 15 in the computing department. And then in 15, 16, we started to pilot Google Classroom um, again in the computing department and then slowly into the business, into the media departments. Then in 17, I was asked by the principal to roll it out across the whole of the college in a, a very steady, planned manner. And then in 17, 18, uh, our Google partner, uh, Vitalize, awarded us leading light status, meaning that we were one of the stronger colleges in the country using Google products, but not only Google products, but other educational tools and technology. So that was the plan that I came up with to uh, roll out to our 1,500 students, including higher education and apprentices. Uh, a nice steady climb up through the, um, the, 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 the students over a period of months. So September worked quite well. We, uh, we came back after the holidays, I delivered some training to some staff, and then they rolled classroom out to their students. Their students then went to functional skills and GCSE lessons and said to their, their lecturers, why aren't you using Google Classroom? So then those lecturers came back to me and said, what is Google Classroom? I delivered some training to them quietly because I wasn't supposed to, to them around Google Classroom and Google Docs and Google Sheets and the like. And then they started to use it with all of their students. Now, functional skills and GCSE lecturers are one of the few departments that meet all other departments. So that meant that by the end of October, it had been rolled out to the whole of the college very, very quickly, very, very rapidly and very, very smoothly. So I could sit back and take a breath. But that never really happens because the next step was to have a look at what the rest we or what the rest of the things we could do with Google. Now, 40% of our students come from North Yorkshire. Um, we get 15% or so of our students from the Tees Valley. We get a, a smaller number of students uh, from the north of us, but the vast majority come from either Darlington itself or, as I say, 40% from North Yorkshire. Now, some of those were spending up to an hour 
getting into college and an hour again getting home from college. That was just lost time. They're transported in on North Yorkshire buses. And they've all got free Wi-Fi. So we thought, well, why don't we get the students to be doing the work on the buses? So we developed a travel to learn plan. What that meant was that we would use the time that the students on the buses for them to do their work. So we'd encourage them, we can't force them, we encourage the students to do their homework that we'd set during the day on their phones so that it was complete by the time they got home. Now, obviously this works for some students and some courses better than others, but what we found that students were spending that time completing the work so that when they got home, their free time was their free time and they didn't have to do any work in, at weekends or in evenings. We also had 34 journalism apprentices. This was three years or so ago. And they were spread all across the country. We had up towards, some up towards Scotland, some down towards Wales. We had two or three down in um, Devon and Cornwall. And their employees were saying that it was really expensive to send these journalism students into the college just for a, uh, a few days. So what we did was we said, well, from now on, you will only come into college twice a year. Once at the beginning of the course to find out who we are and for you to meet your other colleagues. And then also to come in at the end of the course to sit your exam. And that was the only two times that the students would actually come into the college. The rest of the time, they sat at home or they sat in their office and they joined with their lecturer through Google Meet, Google Classroom and Google Drive. And they get taught journalism. So from 9 till 11, they do journalism practice with one lecturer. And then from 11.15 until 1, they do shorthand with another lecturer. And that lecturer has a webcam set up so that she can draw on the board their shorthand. The students sat in their offices, capture that shorthand. They practice it. They can then share that through their camera, through their webcam, or they can take a photograph of it and upload it to Google Drive. The lecturer can then assess it in a normal way. So it means that those students no longer have to come into college for anything apart from their introduction and to sit the exam. And that's now grown to 48 apprentices, and we're looking to grow that even further next year. Now, there are some costs uh, with, with all of this. However, it's a decreasing cost. So we're quite well equipped as a college. We've got over a thousand Back in 2014, 15, we had over a thousand desktop devices. Now that's not pretty good considering that, 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 sorry, that is pretty good considering we had only 1200 full-time students. Those thousand desktop devices were replaced every four years on a, a four year rolling cycle at a cost of in excess of a hundred thousand pounds. Now what we have, we've got just over 1200 devices of which 500 of those are either Chromebooks or Chromeboxes. Now, a Chromebook is a cut-down version of a PC, if you're not familiar, and it just runs the Chrome operating system. And a Chromebox is very similar to a desktop, except it just runs the Chrome operating system, and it's half the price. It means that we've rolled, moved to a six-year uh, replacement cycle, and we've managed to replace 300 PCs with actually more Chromebooks at the same cost. So it now makes up nearly 50% of our IT estate, and we're planning more rollout this year. Now, some of you might be familiar with this at the back of your colleges or your, your place of work. This is what our, um, our skips look like after every governor's meeting. Um, we used to produce 2,500 pages per month for a governor's meeting, and it was only 17 members. It didn't really help communication. It didn't help collaboration. It didn't help cost savings. It didn't help the meetings because the meetings still took a long time for people actually to read, the, read through the documents that they hadn't really had a chance to discuss beforehand. So we created a Google Classroom for the board. We then created sub classrooms for each of the committees. That meant that our print cost reduced to zero. All of the papers and the documents and the spreadsheets for finance were all shared through Google Docs and Sheets and Slides. It meant that people could then collaborate on those documents at home before they actually came in for the governor's meeting. 
It also meant that we saved time and distribution. What we would have to do occasionally was produce documents, parcel them up, but then wait for people to come in and pick them up. That's all gone now. And um, so we now run Google from the top of the college, the Board of Governors, down through our senior management team, down through our curriculum managers, down through our staff and down through our students. So everybody uh, is now Google Classroom. There are one or two support roles, for instance, in finance that haven't moved to Google, but the vast majority have. Another time saving and paper saving that we came up with was we've gone to totally paperless internal verification process. So we created Google Forms that allow us to create an assignment, which is created as a Google Doc. That Google Doc is then attached to a Google Form. That Google Form is then uh, passed to the internal verifier for that unit. They, they carry, it out, carry out the internal verification on that form and then it's returned to the, assessor, to the assessor who wrote the assignment so that they can then pass it out to students. At no time do we use any paper. At no time do we lose anything because it's all backed up to Google and we have a full audit trail. And that was one of the things that both OCR and BTEC liked about this process. We modeled it on their forms, on their, on their, their, their checklist, but we've turned it into a Google form that allows us to have a spreadsheet and a full audit behind it so that everybody can see what's been done, when it was done, and when it went out to the students. It also has improved our collaboration. So pre-Google, collaboration was very poor. It was very much a what's this um, attitude. We, we Collaboration just didn't really take place to a great deal. However, Collaboration now takes place through Google Docs and Sheets and Slides and Classroom. We're collaborated to the nth degree now. There is almost nothing that we don't share with each other. So you might notice there that I have got engineering resources, even though I teach in business and finance and uh, computing. I've still got engineering resources because they run a lot of courses that are very similar to some of our business courses so we can dip in and out of each other's resources. Now not only do we carry out our internal verification using um, the collaborative tools, we've also rolled it out to our awarding bodies. So we use OCR and BTEC and the University of Teesside is who we franchise our higher education courses from. They are all very happy to use Google as a shared environment. So at the end of the year, when we need to send off samples, we will create a folder that we then share with the awarding body. That folder is then populated with the samples of materials that they've asked for. They can access it in their own time at their own pace. And then they, if they have any queries, they can comment straight back to us. And we get those comments straight away. We can add in anything else. So if they need to see more, more evidence of something, we can put that in there instantly. And that means that we're getting much quicker feedback. And all of the awarding bodies have gave us very positive comments about it because it's in one environment. Now, 92% of our students find Google Classroom very easy to use. If you take out the very and you just say easy to use, that actually jumps to 98%. 86% of our students use Classroom from home most days or more. So I don't think I've ever come across a VLE where students have actually been using it actively almost every day. But one of the things that encourages that is the Google Classroom app on their phone. And 82% of our students have downloaded that to their phone. And as I mentioned earlier, that's because they enjoy the social aspect of it. It is very much like a, a Facebook or a WhatsApp uh, environment. It's not very staid. It's not very corporate. It's very student-led. And the vast majority of those that haven't got it on, on their phones either don't have a phone or they don't have a smartphone. Those are the only two reasons really why nobody else has taken it up. 
So you might remember that I said that in 2014, 15, we were awarded a grade four. Well, when Ofsted came back, bearing in mind that all of this work had been carried on through Google, they awarded us good. And that was one of the quickest turnarounds that they, they'd seen. We are number one in the Tees Valley for student achievement rates, and we are fifth nationally. And that's been the case for the last three years running. And we're also ranked number one in the Tees Valley by every week for the student employer satisfaction. So I can't say that all of that is down to Google, but what I can say is that by using the collaborative tools, what it has done is it's changed the culture of the organization, not just for us, but also for the students. Now, you can see here uh, in the last three months, even though we were using Google very, very heavily, you can see that when we got the shutdown, our video hangouts rose by nearly 2,000%. In the week that we got the shutdown, that was actually nearly 4,000%, but it's starting to settle down now over, over time. And we created an extra 17,400 files. So that's an extra lot of paper that would have been printed, that would have been sent out, that would have been packaged up, that would have been a cost. But that's 17,000 pieces of paper that have been saved. That's 17,000 pieces of information that are now stored for students to access at any time and not to lose as they lose it in their bedrooms. So what have we been using? By far one of the most useful tools that we've come across is Screencastify. It allows us to record what's on our screen and it allows us to produce instructional videos that we can share either through Google Classroom or through YouTube to our students. At the minute it's free. Um, there's a code and if anybody wants the code, I can drop it into the, the comments uh, section later on. If you, if you want to know what that is, then, then let me know or let me know through Twitter and I'll share the code with you. The next thing built into Classroom for underneath the Create button are assignments, quizzes and questions. Now, assignments are pretty much as they would say. However, the good thing about an assignment is that it allows you to see in real time a student's work. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. You can actually see the students working in real time. And then the next allows us to assess how the students have performed or how much they've learned in the sessions that we've delivered. So using a quiz assignment or through questions, we can instantly gather their feedback about what they've learned. Now as staff, we've, hang, we, we've heavily gone on to Google Chat. That allows us to communicate without filling up our inbox. So it's very much like um, it's very much like a WhatsApp group, but what it allows you to do is to create, <coughs> excuse me, it allows you to create subheadings within each chat. So rather than it being one long stream, you can create multiple streams and multiple topics. And we're finding that extremely useful to be able to control what goes on within the, the environment. Ooh. Now, um, Shooting ahead. There we are. Hidden behind uh, that, there we are, Peer Grade is another tool that we're using that allows us to create an assignment and a rubric. We upload the rubric to Peer Grade. The assignment is then completed by the students, and then the students upload it to Peer Grade. Peer Grade then randomly assigns a student to Peer Grade somebody else's work. That takes the onus of you as a lecturer, because it means that you then don't have to go through everybody's work to point out all of the simple mistakes that they've made. The students do that themselves. So it saves time and it saves resources. And then finally, on that last screen there, we've got our staff meetings. We still have our staff meetings every Thursday morning, cup of coffee in hand with um, everybody from the, the business team and the IT team, which is what we can see there. Then that also rolls out to our students. So here you can see part of my foundation degree in business group, and they were delivering a presentation, a group presentation on zero-based 
uh, our contracts. Nicole there, the, the girl in the center, she's the one that's presenting at the minute. And you can see she's presenting in the bottom right hand side there, the presentation that she created in a Google form, a Google um, slides. Now, all of those had been involved in that. All of those had worked collaboratively, collaboratively to produce that document. And then they all sat in their own living rooms or their own office space and presented their part of that document. So here we can see, as I mentioned earlier, about students working in real time. So there we've got five students working on a document that I asked them to complete to let me know which tasks they'd completed on a, on a current assignment. Now I just put out a blank document and I asked them to produce the format of um, how they wanted it uh, presented to me. So they created what you can see there and you can see them working collaboratively on that one document. But you can also see who isn't working. So you can see that Roshan, for instance, hasn't done an awful lot. And I know now that I need to have a word with Roshan and say, look, um, can you uh, get a little bit of a, a G up? So I've got nine little top tips as it were. And um, these have come together from myself and some other staff who have been using um, distance learning techniques for quite some time. Now, one of the things that you will find is that anything that you would do in a classroom, it will take you five times longer to do online. It just does. And there's not a way around it. Students will work a lot slower. Students will work um, at their own pace. They will need a lot more support. So with that in mind, you need to think about how you can shorten each of your tasks or each of your activities or each of your sessions so that it becomes manageable. Now, when I'm saying short, I mean really, really short, no longer than five or 10 minutes. So you need to deliver for a couple of minutes and then give a task to staff and to, to give a task to the students to, to do for 10 minutes and then bring them back again and then send them away again and then bring them back again. And between all of that, you need to keep your instructions very, very simple because the more time that they need to come back to you to clarify, the less time they're actually working. Each week or each session, allow the students time to get used to it again. They've been away from, from college, they've been away from school, they've been away from each other. So every week they're going to have to sit down and rejoin and re-talk to each other and, and get out that bit that they've missed from being in college. They don't have that social time anymore. So at the, end, at the beginning of every lesson, I allow five or ten minutes for the students just to chat. And then I bring them on task and then we move forward. Number three, don't expect the great things to begin with or at all or indeed ever. Um, this can never replace face-to-face -face teaching for some students. For some, it will work really, really well and they actually prefer it. For some, they don't like it. But it does augment teaching practice. So don't expect wonderful things to happen. Give the learners time to settle, as I've already mentioned, and personalise it. Now, what happened with my students uh, when I started to teach remotely a few months ago, prior to all of this, one group of my students at break time stood up and one of them said, um, I'm going to show you around my house. So he took his laptop and he went around his house and he said, this is the kitchen, this is the living room, this is the dining room, there's my garden. And then another one joined in, oh, I'll show you my house. By the end of the break time, they'd all gone around each other's houses. Now, this is no different to if they'd been in the real world and they all live close to each other, they would go and visit each other's houses and they would see where each other lives. Now, bizarrely, I teach the same topic to two groups. And that very same week, the second group independently did exactly the same activity and they don't talk. So there must be something there that at some point students feel a need to share and link with other students by showing them their, their cribs, their space. Number seven, I mentioned earlier about using um, assignments so that you can see students work. 
that's a good way of keeping them on their toes. If they know that you are there and you're able to put comments on their work in real time, then they're going to keep working. So the way that I structure my session, as I say, is I'll have a five or 10 minutes for them to have a chat. Then we pull them together. I give them an introduction and then I give them a very short task for them to get grounded with. No more than five minutes. Once they've got that grounding task out of the way, we pull them back again and we give them more work to do. 10 minutes of work, go away, produce this, come back in 10 minutes. So they produce that work back in 10 minutes. While they're doing that, I cycle through their work and I can give them private comments in real time. So it's not shared to the rest of the class, it's given independently to them. Number eight, allowing a bit of flexibility around breaks. Well, that comes because we're asking them now to work professionally. We're asking them to work maturely. And I don't know what you're like, but if I want to get up and make a cup of coffee, I will get up and make a cup of coffee when I need to. If I need to go to the loo, I'll go to the loo. If I need to hang some washing out, I'll hang some washing out. My wife probably says that I don't, but I do. And it's about that managing their own time and their own behavior. So many of my students have said that they actually feel that they're being trusted to work independently. They're being trusted to work uh, on their own and that this is allowing them to develop those professional skills. So if they are developing those skills, we need to praise them. So lots and lots of praise for working well and independently and being able to manage that workload. Now, something I've been asked about just the past couple of weeks, both on Twitter and in person, is about safeguarding. What are the issues around safeguarding? But I remember going to a conference some years ago, and somebody at that conference, I can't remember who they are, but they said that you don't solve a technological issue by putting more technology in. You solve it by training the people. You solve it by the people who are engaged with that technology. So you use policies and you use procedures. So there are lots and lots of technological solutions to some of these safeguarding issues. But what you will probably find is that they will limit what you are able to do. So I've got six little tools or six little techniques. The first is no embarrassing laundry. So whatever's in the background, you get rid of. So think about what the camera can see. If you've got laundry hanging there, move it. If you've got pictures on the wall that maybe uh, could open some sort of discussion, move them or you move to an area where that wouldn't cause that discussion now the only time we've ever had an issue like this was about three years ago we had a student who we we who shared his screen and his screen server clicked in and it was an inappropriate image that's all i'll say we quickly um, moved on to somebody else and then we dealt with that through the normal disciplinary procedure it wasn't professional, it wasn't, it didn't fit with our standards, so we were managed to follow it through our normal disciplinary procedure. But what we didn't do was make a big deal of it. We deal with it appropriately. Next, be dressed, uh, both you and the students. We always say to the students, turn up, be ready to work. So that means you're washed, you're showered, you're breakfasted, you're dressed, and you're ready and you're raring to get on. What we don't allow is students to appear in their dressing gowns. We don't allow them to be eating their breakfast. We don't allow them to be uh, have a, a unmade beds behind them. We're expecting them to be ready to work and present. If you are concerned, then let others know what you are doing. That way, they can join in the class if they really want to. Um, so you could have another colleague join in the classroom at a point in time if you are concerned about the way that a classroom could be issue, could could be um, deteriorating, but on that point, don't treat online learning as a classroom. It isn't. You're not in control like you are in a normal classroom. Those students are in their relaxed space. They are in their living rooms. They're in the dining rooms. They're in the kitchens. They're in their bedrooms. That is their space. It's not yours. So you can't treat it like a normal classroom. So you have to think about what works for you and what works for your students, but you have to relinquish some control. And then the next two are, are linked, five and six. Don't take it seriously, but do take it professionally. Things will go wrong. Things will break. As we've just seen, my presentation broke there. Uh, students will laugh. 
You will make mistakes. Other students will make mistakes. But don't take it seriously. And if you don't know what you're doing, hold your hands up and say, I don't know what I'm doing. Who can help me? And finally, it's very easy for students to fall into an online world that they are used to. A lot of students play games online now. A lot of students make friends online. So their behavior needs to be encouraged by you, not by them. So you need to drag them away from that banter, if you like, into a, a more professional environment. So my last point is about being friendly, but not friends with the students. You want them to come back, but you don't want them to come back because you're their friend. So where next for Darlington College? Well, we've invested heavily in virtual reality and augmented reality equipment. We are starting to build tours of the college. We've already built tours of uh, some points in Darlington. So we've created uh, for the Forum Music Centre, we've created uh, a full 360 tour for anybody that wants to go onto their website and have a look around their building. And also prior to this, and now, Definitely, we are looking at more flexible learning pathways. Not only does it save the college money, but it suits some students much, much better. So we're looking at more blended learning pathways and more flexibility in the way that we deliver and when we deliver our lessons and sessions. So that's it. I hope you're all still there and you haven't disappeared like you had earlier. And uh, I'll come back into the chat now.